Hey, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> happening. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. So glad you chose to worship with us. Would you stand? And those of you watching online, why don't you stand with us in your living room or at your office or wherever you are? And let's invite the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. He is our invited guest. I don't know about you, but we need more of the presence of God in our lives. Amen. Holy Spirit, come. Come in power. Come in might. Come and do what you do best. Lead us to Jesus. Magnify, exalt, lift up the one we've come to worship on this Labor Day weekend, Lord, may we rest, may we set aside the time to just be in your presence, to know you more, to have more power, to have more understanding of the times that we live in, so that we can be an impact to those around us. So come, Holy Spirit, do what you do best, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen and amen. Come on, let's worship. Can 
are here this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo. Amen. Why don't you wave at somebody and tell them you're glad they're in the house today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> then you may be seated and watch the overhead for the week's announcements. Welcome to Riverside Church. Let's take a look at this week's announcements. Be a part of 100 Days of Prayer, July 27th through November 3rd. Complete details at RiversideAOG.com. Join us for the new series, What in the World is Going On, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Sue Trambino from Family Research Council will be with us Wednesday, September 9th at 7 p.m. We hope you'll make plans to attend. Thanks for coming. We're so glad you're here. Two things real quick. If you're having issues with opening the prayers on the 100 days of prayer, let me encourage you. Uh, it's possible that because you don't have an Apple system and you have an Android, uh, you have to work it through the website. So when you go to the app, just press the website button and you should be able to access it through uh, the website. For some reason, Android has an issue with our app maker that uh, it doesn't like PDFs for some reason. And so if you run into trouble, just see Orlando and he can fix everything. Let me just tell you that. And so um, no pressure, Orlando, no pressure. <laughs> but he can. Usually when I have trouble with my iPad, I say, here, just fix it. Amen. <laughs> Between him and Zach, I'm okay. If they're not here, I'm in trouble. So anyway, but we are running those prayers each and every week. It starts, we, day one starts on Monday. Day one starts on Monday and, of course, runs through Sunday. Day seven is on Sunday. This week, the staff will be writing our prayers. They're prayers of faith. And so we've been running through the seven different kinds of prayers. As last week, we had the prayers of petition. Today's the last day of the prayer of petition. And so we're, we're moving forward in this 100 days of prayer. One of the most important days will be uh, September 26th when we pray uh, 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 13 and 14, which if you've been following uh, the return online, you understand what I'm talking about. And so uh, I, get, I encourage you to get Jonathan Kahn's new book, uh, Harbinger 2, and it'll explain a lot of what I'm talking about. Because how many believe we're in the end times right now? Come on, somebody. Um, second thing I want to mention is, of course, with our series on Wednesday night, What in the World's Going On? This Wednesday is probably one of those keys. Uh, Sue Trambino is a lady that works for the uh, Family Research Council. Our nation is at a crossroads, a very serious crossroads. And she comes with some information, not only personally, but also from the Family Research Council that is just absolutely phenomenal. We don't tell you how to vote. We just tell you what to look at. We tell you to look at the platforms, and we hold it to God's Word in accordance with what we as Christians believe. So I encourage you to come and hear what she has to say. If you have questions, she is not afraid to answer questions. You will find this lady not only to be a breath of fresh air, but she, will be, she won't beat around the bush. She'll tell you exactly what the Word of God says. And so I encourage you to be here Wednesday. If you can't be here, watch online because it will be online as well. Amen? Amen, amen. Amen. Who's a happy, hilarious giver today? Amen. I tell you what, it's exciting for the preacher when he wakes up and there's not only giving for himself, but every person in his house has an envelope beside his bed. Come on, somebody. In my house, they bring it to the priest, and they want the priest to bring it to church. I always tell Zach, Zach, bring your own offering. No, Dad, i got to give it to you. That's what the Bible says. So. <laughs> oh, the literal ones in my house. Amen. We have two stations at the front, two stations in the back. The easiest way, of course, of the five ways to give is the app. Just press the heart button, and it will be self-explanatory. And by the way, we're in the process of changing all that because our app company was bought out and so you'll get a call from Orlando or Angie in the weeks coming it's not going to be a hard change as a matter of fact it's going to make it that much easier is that what I'm he's shaking his head so <laughs> I'm just I found them. this makes me very nervous <laughs> let me just tell you so let's stand and I'm going to pray over the offering and then you can bring it forward or to the back father thank you for the privilege 
it is to worship you in our giving. We give because you first gave to us. You gave Jesus so that we could have life. And we give back a portion of what you've blessed us with through your tithes and our offerings, our faith commitments to missions, to do exactly what we want it to do, go around the world touching hearts and lives with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for the lives that are being changed, for the people that are committing to Christ, for the people that are saying, you know what, it's time to get my life right. Father, as we give, we give with that in mind. So, Lord, bless it, multiply it, meet every need, especially those of our missionaries, Lord. They're so desperate right now in this season. So, Lord, just bless your people so in turn they can bless. In Jesus' name, and everyone says amen and amen. Come on, let's give.
it couldn't feel me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Come on, then you, then you came along, oh yes, oh yes, and put me back together.
ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Just one more time to close. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, yes, oh, yes. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, oh, yes just 30 seconds stretch your hands towards heaven and with your words begin to worship begin to just honor begin to bless and begin to thank him that there is nothing better than him nothing better than being in his presence nothing better than being in his midst thank you lord thank you for your goodness and your grace thank you for your love your unconditional love Thank you for the Spirit's power that you give to us so that we don't have to walk alone. There's nothing better than you, Jesus. Fill us with that promise today, Lord. Every heart, every person, every life that's represented in this place today, Lord. Fill every heart with that promise. Those that have come in discouraged, lift that discouragement right now. Those who have come in needing help, give them that help that they so need. Those that need a touch in their body, do it right now. Those who need restoration, give them that restoration. Whatever they need, may they find it in you because there's nothing that's better than you. So God, we give you praise. We give you praise. Lord, we we pray for John and Carol's a son, Jonathan, Lord, who's needing a touch from heaven with his heart, Lord, as he's in CCU up in the hospital. Father, we just speak life in this young man's body, Lord God. We pray, Father God, that you would just right now invade that CCU unit, Lord God, with your presence and your healing power according to the stripes that Jesus took upon his back. Whatever is in disrepair, bring healing by the stripes that Jesus took upon his back. Give his wife and family peace. Give John and Carol peace as they simply trust you that you are the God that heals and hears our cries today. We pray for those who are heavy hearted today, Lord, because of the loss of loved ones. Deanne is here, Lord. Lord, we pray for her and her family, Lord, as her precious mother went home to be with the Lord a few weeks ago, Lord. Father, I just pray that the comfort that she would have and her family would have is knowing that she's no longer in any kind of pain but she is walking streets of gold looking into the eyes of her Savior. Pray the same thing for Orlando and his family on the loss of his father, Lord God. Father, just right now, give them the strength, give them the peace that they know that Freddie is with you, Lord. No longer having any issues, no longer having any problems, no longer being on the morphine drip, no longer being on the food tube, no longer being on anything, Lord, but just rejoicing. As Revelations promises, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, all rejoicing. But be with these two families, Lord. Wrap your loving arms around them. Use your body to encourage and to strengthen these precious ones who need a touch from heaven. And God, we just ask today, as we ask every weekend, we pray for our nation according to your word. You told us, pray for those in authority so you can live in peace. So Father, we pray for every person that has any kind of authority in our country, in our government, whether it's in Washington or in Tallahassee or here in Main Street, Lord. Many of them need to be born again. That will definitely change the way they govern. So we say, so be it, Lord so that we can live in peace. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. May your people see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, so true peace comes. And all of
across the community today, Lord, as the body of Christ gathers in many different places, some online, some still worshiping that way because of issues and situations, some in their buildings. We pray for Pastor Jamie, who has uh, their first service back after having to close again because of so much COVID in their church. Lord, we just speak life over Trinity today. As he spoke life to us last week, we speak life today. May the Spirit of the living God breathe just deeply on that congregation today and they receive. Father, we thank you. Do that in this house. Changing every heart, every life, so that when we leave this place, we can say we've been with God. And so, Lord, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Come on, give Jesus a big hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Moses. Thank you, worship team. If you want to get a head start, you can turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 will be uh, in verse uh, 30, excuse me, will be in verse 32, 31 to start here in just a minute. We're going to move our Breakthrough Living in Times Like These series from pause, where we've been in a season of pause, to, I believe, a season that I believe that we're in right now, that the Lord is preparing His church, His bride, not only for the hour that we live, but also for when He returns. You know, there, there's so many people that have so many beliefs and so many things that, that I, I think is very um, scary to me, number one. But number two is, is shows... Um, that the church at large, um, pastors, leaders, teachers, even those on television, have, have not done a good service teaching certain things because we've, we've taught bits and pieces and we've taught what people want to hear. And, and you know, the scripture tells us in the end that's what will happen. We'll, we'll, we'll say things that all we want is for ears to be tickled. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not so sure my job is to get you to be happy. My job is to get you to change. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and, you know, here's the thing. Most people don't want to change. I mean, our season that we're in right now, you know, pause and all that we've gone through with the COVID and everything. Let's be honest. We don't like change. How many of you are happy that they took up the arrows at Publix? Let me see your hand. Somebody said, glory. Nobody followed them anyway. <laughs> Michelle went into the store the other day, and she come out, because I didn't go with her. Usually I, go, I do the shopping, and, and, which is a big thing in our house. But anyway, because with Michelle, it's an event, right? I'm there to conquer. Give me the list. I'm in. I'm out. No, she wants to go down every row. She wants to hold things. She wants to talk to it. She wants to look at it, you know. I mean, she's not here. I can pick on her. So anyway, you don't show up, you get picked on. All right. But for, for me, it's like in and out. And so them, them arrows, just they, they bothered me, okay? They bothered me. And I, I'm a rule follower. I know some of you think that's wrong, but I, I'm a rule follower. If they want us to go one way, I'm going to go that way. So I would literally, even if it was right here, I would go all the way around, come back so I could get it because that's just me. I've just been taught that my whole life. My dad is not living, but if he would, I just could feel him slapping me on the back of the head for going down the wrong aisle, you know, with the arrow. But, you know, number one, I think they realize that nobody's following it anyway. And number two, it's not the problem. That's not the problem. And so uh, hopefully they'll do that at Walmart. Now, I don't go there, but, but we, we don't like change. Let's be honest. We don't like change. I mean, you know, church people, we don't like change. People in the world, we don't like change. We, we like things pretty much to stay the same. But sometimes change comes, and sometimes change happens uh, that God wants us to live in an atmosphere of change so that we're changing constantly from glory to glory to glory, the Bible says. So I want to show you something here in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, two verses. Now, now Paul is telling the church at Ephesus, he's talking, he's really talking about Jesus and the church. He's talking about Jesus and his bride, okay? And he uses marriage and he uses the analogy, which you can apply to your marriage, but he uses it to kind of give uh, the way he feels about the church. 
And so one of the things he says here that I think is most telling is he's talking here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 through 27. He says that he might sanctify. By the way, that's not, I didn't do that purposefully. That, that's the way it starts. This is where it starts, that, that word that. And cleanse her, talking of the church, with the washing of the water of how? Of the word. That he might present her to himself, talking of the bride, to himself, a glorious church, not having what? Or wrinkle, or any, everybody say any, any. such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, some people would argue and say, well, that already took place. The minute I was saved, I became perfect. And that's really what people say. I, I'm under grace. I, I don't have to really worry about my life anymore. I can do whatever I want. And that would be wrong. Because grace is not the empowerment to live the way you are. No, grace is the empowerment to change. Because you can't do it in your own strength. You have to have Christ's strength. You can't do it in your own power. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got to let the Father live big in you so that you can change from glory to glory to glory. And so Jesus is coming back. How many know that he's coming back? And he's coming back soon, I believe. And that literally he's been preparing a place for us. We know that in John 14. That's totally all Middle Eastern, the way that they do uh, the, the prenup, if you will, before the, the, the ceremony, before uh, the, the wedding begins to be consummated and all those things. You know, he's gone to prepare a place for us. That's why he's gone. And the, he's overseeing that beautiful, uh, you know, building project in heaven for his bride, which is big. Not meaning that she's fat, but she's big, all right? Because there's a lot of us. But he's coming back for a bride, for a glorious bride that's without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So, in other words, when, when Jamie last week said that God's not going to let you coexist with your giant. You remember him saying that? Okay. In other words, and, you, and, and a lot of people say this. A lot of people say this. You know, well, God and me have an understanding because I'm under grace. I can still live like this, i.e. I can still drink. I can still, you know, drug. I can still do these things because God understands. He, he has mercy and grace on us. And yes, he has mercy and grace on us, but he does not want to leave you there because all you do is you live in a state to where you have no freedom. And you're of no power and authority in a world that needs to see that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above we, all we can ask or think. So, I believe that what the Lord is doing right now in this season, that we're paused, we're kind of stopped, you know, some things are, are allowed, some things aren't, you know, we can, we can go a little bit more, and of course they're beginning to open more things up, but as we've been in this season, I pray that, that your life is being changed, and one of the ways that He does that is I believe we're in a season of pruning. Personally, each one, and even in church, we're in a season of pruning where... Uh, some things are being taken away that don't produce growth and don't produce uh, what he wants to see in our lives. Now, if you've ever seen them prune uh, orange trees here in the state of Florida, it is quite something to see. Because they don't do it by hand. They bring in these massive machines with saw blades. Anybody ever seen it? I have. I've actually pulled off the side of the road... Uh, on State Road 60 going back and forth to the district office when I was uh, a volunteer department head over there for many years and watched uh, in Lake Wales as they were pruning the citrus trees for the next season. And I'm telling you what, now I could only imagine if I could talk to the orange trees, if I said, do you like this, would they say yes? Because it doesn't look very comfortable. You've got this massive saw blade, one on each side as they go down the, the rows of the trees, and they do it on both sides and the top, so that the trees, all the dead is cut off, all the unproductive is cut off, so that they can produce, so they can produce more in the coming seasons. And maybe that's where God has us. And maybe, maybe even now as I'm speaking to you by the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is already put his thumb 
on that very thing that you know you need to deal with in your life that he wants to prune. And the minute you uh, feel the pruning shears of the Holy Spirit come, you, you know, you kind of duck. The prophet comes, you don't show up because you're afraid he'll call you out. Dad, um, one of the greatest testimonies that we got on Dad's life was people were always afraid of my father because um, God would speak to him and speak through him and, and use him in, in words of knowledge and, and, you know, different things like that. And so when he would come into church, he'd get this, this look on his face when he was looking for somebody. And Lynn Cobb told the story once. She said, I saw your father coming. And I bowed my head in prayer. <laughs> and he had a word for her. He wanted her to do something that the Lord had said. I don't remember. But she said, I just could see it in his face. And so, you know, sometimes that's the way it is with the Lord. We, we don't want to hear the tough things. We don't want to hear that maybe there's an area of change. But you know what? If we'll allow him to prune us, we will grow and we'll see God use us. So let's look here and see if Pastor Grant is telling the truth. I hope so. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Let me set the stage for you. We're at the Last Supper. The disciples are having their last meal with Jesus. And he's gone through a whole process here. Of course, it's the Passover. It's the Seder. They've, they've gone through the meal. They've had all the, the differences in the Passover at this particular one because Jesus would institute uh, the um, communion meal that you and I understand and, and the institute of the two atonements in his body and blood. But then he also washes their feet and, of course, he sends Judas out, go do what you must do and do it quickly and all those kind of things. And, and he gets to verse 31 where he says, Then Jesus said to them, talking of all those that were remaining in the upper room, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, now think about that statement, okay? For three years, these old boys have literally put their lives on pause. They've, they've put their stuff aside. They've stopped fishing. Uh, Matthew stopped tax collecting. And, you know, uh, the zealots stopped trying to fight the government and all those kind of things. They put everything on pause so that they could follow Jesus and, and witness all that they saw. And so, literally, you can only imagine what this made them feel like. Literally, you can only imagine where they are like, what is he saying? Why would he say this? Now, let's keep reading. Verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Boy, Peter. And basically what Peter did was what Jesus was looking for. He wants to prune something out of Peter's life. As a matter of fact, he wants to get, out, get it out of Peter's life so that Peter can be the rock that the church is going to be built on. Because be, Peter would be the, the leader of the church. So, he exposed the very thing that he needed to take care of. And some of us, that's where we're at right now. Some of you, the, the situation has caused anger to rise up in your heart. And all of a sudden, something that you thought you dealt with is still there. Maybe there's unforgiveness. Maybe there's fear. During this whole season... Uh, this series we're going to talk about. I'm going to have a little plan up here and we're going to actually prune something. I'll have a little card on it. It'll tell us what we're going to talk about for the week. One week it'll probably be uh, fear because right now the church of Jesus Christ is in fear. The church of Jesus Christ has allowed fear to control their lives. And granted, we have to be careful. We have to be safe and all that. But church, we're doing the best we can with the protocols that we've been given to make sure that you don't have to be afraid and so I'm amazed that I can see people uh, at Walmart and at Publix and at other events, and yet they can't come to church. Now, don't cut me off on that online thing. Oh, I'm just going to hit him. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to get you to see something. Now, if, if we're living in fear and not faith, there's a problem. Because we're supposed to be people of faith. We're supposed to be people that trust in the one that we know 
is he's always enough, right? Everybody okay? Okay, just making sure you're not going to stone me or anything. All right, here we go. Verse 34, Jesus looks right at him with all the compassion and love that he can say. And he says to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the other disciples. What is God trying to prune in Peter's life? Original sin. Original sin is not disobedience. Did you know that? Original sin is not murder, if you thought that just because Cain killed Abel. No, original sin is what Satan did when he wanted to ascend the throne of heaven. Because look at me, I'm so great. The created trying to be the creator. Pride is probably one of the worst things that we deal with in our lives because, you know, even as Americans, we can be proud that we're Americans. There's nothing wrong with that, and, and there's nothing wrong with pride. You're proud of your children, and if it, but when pride begins to take over your life, that's a problem. Here's Peter. He's basically saying to Jesus, listen, I got it. I'm, I'm with you. I'll even die next to you if I have to. But that's pride in Peter's life because Peter is stuck on Peter. Peter is not stuck on Jesus. So let's see what happens. Turn down to Matthew 26. Skip down to verse 69 now. This is a big chapter, by the way. Verse 69. So here we have Jesus has gone through the Passover. They've gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has prayed, let this cup pass from me. Judas has come, kissed him. Uh, they've now taken him, and of course, many of the disciples have already done exactly what Jesus said and fleed, but some of them are following along behind, some of them are, are looking out, and Peter's one of those, and so they go into the courtyard there at Caiaphas' house, and, and they, they kind of they sit at the fire because they want to hear what's going on and trying to keep themselves incognito, and verse 69 says, And Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them, all saying, I do not know what you are saying. Verse 71. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied it with an oath. In other words, I swear to God. Verse uh, 72, I do not know the man. Verse 73, and a little later, those who stood by him came and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. What does that mean? Remember, you know, they always said that, you know, nothing good could come from uh, Nazareth or Galilee because they're hillbillies, they're hicks, they're fishermen. Don't pick on the fishermen, right, Mason? Right, John? I mean, you know, we've got a reputation. Our town is a fishing town. It's a fishing village. That's a good thing. People that like to eat fish, come on somebody. Shrimp and grits, come on somebody. Amen. John, I'm still bitter about this shrimp and grits. But anyway, I'll get over it. He makes great um, shrimp and grits. Some of you just need Jesus. All right. Um, they said, we, we can tell you're a Galilean. And then Peter does the unthinkable. Verse 74. Then he begins to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Jesus exposed something in Peter that needed to be pruned. He exposed something in Peter, not to hurt Peter. Listen, God never does this kind of stuff to hurt us. He always does this stuff to help us, to further us in our development. Now, as young believers, usually those things are easier to deal with. But as we get older... And as we get more set in our ways and we get a little knowledge under our belt, we begin to think we've got it all together. How many of you realize the older you get, the less you know? You know, when I was a young 20-something, 
coming to this church uh, to help Pastor Tom, he will tell you that I had all the answers. And I told him. And he never said too much. Sometimes he would make correction when needed to be. But he, he just was so kind and compassionate um, to me, grace, gracious and merciful. But I was full of myself. And then he decided to retire, and here I am, and I don't know anything. <laughs> and guess what? I'm in good, great company because I don't think any of you know anything either. <laughs> People say that this gray in my beard and, and my hair that you will never see because, you know, oh, we have things for that. But um, it's wisdom. I don't know if it's wisdom or if it's just our wisdom leaving. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, God wants to deal with us right where we are so that we can grow so that he can use us even more effectively. And that's exactly where he's got Peter. Now, it would be a miss if... Literally, we left Peter in that situation without him being pruned, without that part that Jesus wants to remove. And you know what's interesting to me is Matthew does not record uh, Peter's restoration. As a matter of fact, Mark does not record it, and neither does Luke. The only recording comes in the book of John. So turn over to John chapter 21, and let's look here in verse 15. So Jesus has died, been buried, raised from the dead... And now he has gone, like he said, into Galilee to see his disciples. And of course, we know why they went back to Galilee, because for most of them, they were fishermen. And so Peter, on this day, he decides that he's going fishing. And they go out fishing, and guess what? It was a bad night, Mason. It was a bad night, John. Because they didn't catch anything. No fish were running. I mean, you know, the tachometers were not working. They were not showing the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, all the, the weather wasn't working out. It was just bad. And so all night long, they caught nothing. Zero, nada. Not even one bite. Not even one little minnow in the net. But Jesus is walking on the shore. And he hollers to them and says, Have you caught anything? And they say, No. And he says, Cast your net on the other side. Now, I don't know if you know much about people who know something about what they do, but they don't usually take to somebody trying to tell them, you know. People always love to tell me how to preach. I mean, even today, I'll have somebody come and say, well, Pastor Grant, you should say this, and you shouldn't say that. And I always want to say, you know what? Next service is at 1045. Why don't you stand here and give the word? Oh, don't get mad. I'm not saying I can't take correction, but sometimes some of our petty, picky little things are a little bit unnecessary. I mean, you know, don't you think these two guys know how to fish? Well, they've done it a long time. I would never tell them their business. But, of course, the creator of the universe is walking the seashore, and he knows something that they don't. Because he can make fish appear where there are no fish. And he can even create them if he has to. And so he says to them, verse uh, 15, he says, they have, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus calls them in, and of course they know it's him, and it, they catch the catch and all that. And, and after they had eaten some breakfast, because Jesus has already made the meal, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, and I want you to notice Peter's answers. Notice what he says but notice what he doesn't say. Do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love me. I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you were, girded your th- you were girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you stretched out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken, in, spoken this, he said to him, probably the most famous words, follow me. Now, I want, I want to go back to the very first time that Jesus says to him, do you love me? Jesus put something in there that tried to get him to see if he'd allowed the Holy Spirit to prune that pride and that arrogance out of his life. He says, again, let me read it. He says, do you love me more than these? Because see, remember what Peter had said to Jesus. He said, the rest of them will run away. I won't. He says, I I, I won't deny you. They might, but I'm not going to. His pride and his arrogance. And Jesus wanted to make sure that that was all gone. And three times he asked him the same question because, of course, three times he denied him. So he wanted to solidify the fact that he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that not only had Peter learned his lesson, but also that that issue had been pruned from his life. And I want to give you four things that I believe that helps when we understand pruning in our lives so that it'll help us to set the stage for the future of this series. Everybody okay? First thing, why is pruning so important? Number one, it eliminates the dead parts. It eliminates the dead parts. When you prune a tree, whether it's a fruit-bearing tree or if it's a shrub or a bush or what have you, you're eliminating those parts that are not productive, those parts that are not producing, those parts that are not uh, giving life to the plant that are just there. As a matter of fact, if you don't prune or you don't cut a tree that has dead limbs on it, what happens when we have a storm? The dead limbs usually cause damage, right? I remember a big oak tree in my grandmother's backyard before Hurricane uh, David came through. And one of the limbs that my grandfather had never really had time to cut was dead. It didn't have any life on it. And it was pretty rotten. But the fact of the matter is he alone by himself couldn't do it. And of course, uh, me and Graham were not old enough to help him yet. We were only maybe about nine or ten years of age. And my uncles were always so busy. And so... Um, He was driving the school bus at that time, so he never really had time. Well, during Hurricane David, that limb actually broke off. You remember that? That big limb broke off. It, thank God, didn't cause any damage to the rental house that they had, but it did cause damage to the tree to where the tree had to be removed because he did not eliminate the dead part. That big old beautiful oak tree that we swang in, that we had built forts in, that we had all this, was totally eliminated because of that one rotten branch. Because when it broke off, that dead part broke off, it ripped up the tree so bad that they said the tree would not live and it would just cause more damage. And so they had to cut it off. Friends, let me tell you something. Even though you're born again, even though you're washed in the blood, even though you've experienced and tasted the grace and the mercy of God, there are still parts of your life that are dead and need to be removed. There are still parts of your life that you don't need to be caught up in. Right now, it's very easy because we have so much time on our hands. We have so much uh, extra ability that if we're not careful, if we've got dead parts in our lives, we can reactivate them to where they cause more damage in our life if we don't deal with them. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, uh, the writer here tells us, Therefore, since uh, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, talking about all those who have gone before, Okay, He's writing to believers. He's not writing to unbelievers. We, we read the scriptures and we try to read it for people that it's not written for. It's written for you and me. It's written for us as believers. He says, let us lay aside. Let us, let you, let me, let us allow the Holy Spirit to deal with this weight, this sin, which so easily ensnares us. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Each person in this room knows exactly. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's resentment. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's doubt. I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit wants to deal with it. He wants to cut that dead part out of your life so it doesn't hinder you from the growth that you need in your life. Let us uh, let the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us do what? Let us run the race that is set before us. The next part says, looking unto Jesus, author, finisher, perfecter of our faith. 
Friends, let me tell you something. That's exactly what he wants to do with pruning. He wants to prune out the dead so that we can live more abundant, more productive, more fruitful lives for the kingdom. I'm glad Gary's with me. All right, number two. Why is pruning so important? It prepares us for future growth. It prepares us. Like I told you when you watch them do the citrus trees. And I'm sure that, you know, they probably do this in other uh, venues too. Maybe with uh, apples or peaches. I'm not sure. I've never seen that. But I've always seen with the oranges because that's our, our state, you know, issue there. But literally, they cut off all that dead. They cut off all that non-producing. They cut off all that that keeps them from growing so that literally they're getting ready for the season that will come. They're getting ready for the flowers that will be produced in those citrus trees so that more citrus will come on the scene. More citrus. That's exactly what Holy Spirit wants to do for you and for me. He wants to cut out that dead stuff in our lives so that we're ready to grow in the future. So that when we have issues like we're facing right now with COVID-19, with all the stuff that we're facing in our nation, with the rioting and all this stuff, it doesn't sway us. Does it concern us? Yes. But our focus is always on Jesus. We know he has the answer. He said he'd never leave us nor forsakes us. He's getting us ready so that we have impact on those around us. So we're producing that fruit so that we're not living in fear. So we're not living in doubt. So we're literally just allowing Holy Spirit to live big in us. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. Look at this. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. What's Peter saying? He's saying, look, learn from me. Don't let your dead issue keep you from the growth and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let your dead issue keep you from being so steadfast in the things of God that you literally are not, you're blinded by it. You're, you're, that's all you focus on. Can I tell you, that's usually the problem. We're so caught up in our own little mess that we can't help anybody else out of theirs. And we've been born again for the reason so that our life can change from glory to glory so that we can help somebody else out of their mess like we've been helped out of ours. Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness being led away with the error of the wicked. Notice, and, and here again, Peter's not writing to heathens. He's not writing to pagans. He's not writing to those outside. No, he's writing to us. He's writing to us as believers. He's saying, listen... Don't get caught up in all that old stuff. Allow Holy Spirit to do what He has to do to prune your life from the dead stuff that's keeping you from walking into all that God's glory has for you. Look at this, verse 18. But grow, everybody say grow. Grow. In the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Stop right there. Wait a second. I thought we got grace when we got saved. Because we come by faith through grace for salvation. Yes, that's true. But how many know that there's depth to grace? There's depth to the understanding of knowing who we are and whose we are in Christ. See, this is the problem. Too many of us, we're just satisfied with the surface. But Father God wants to go deeper. Jesus wants us to go deeper. Holy Spirit wants us to go deeper. He wants us to grow in that understanding, that unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor called grace. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of who Christ is and what he has done for us. He wants us to grow in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to live like the world does, not, wor- not wondering, you know, what's going to happen next. No, we already know. we got our focus. We're on our journey. This is just a stopping point. This is not, this is not uh, where we're going to end up. We're just passing through on our pilgrimage. We're just passing through as citizens of another nation, of citizens of another realm, of citizens of another kingdom and so we're growing in that grace we're growing in that knowledge see that's exactly what pruning does for us it helps prepare us for future growth so that God can use us see some of you you think you've grown and you're you're to where God wants you oh no no he wants to take you even much farther he wants to take you much farther some of my precious seniors who are in the winter of your life you think he's done with you you're retired you're done no he's not 
No, he's not. As a matter of fact, you're not retired, you're refired. And that's not fired, you're fired. No, no, you are refired. It's time to get the power of the Holy Spirit because you can, you, listen, some of you, you can say things I can't say. I'm serious. You can say things that I cannot say. You can talk to people the way I can't talk to them. Why? Because you've got snow on the roof or none on the roof. And they'll listen to you because they look to you as that grandma or that grandpa or that aunt or that uncle or that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Why? Because you have influence. But if your life's a mess, they don't want to listen to you. So grow in the grace and the knowledge. Don't give up. Don't say you're done. No, he's still got much more for you to accomplish. Why is pruning so important? Number three, it reminds us that he loves us. Can, can we just be honest? Do you think Peter felt like Jesus loved him when he said, you'll deny me three times? No. No. But did Jesus really love him? Absolutely. And Jesus was not going to let Peter stay in his arrogance and pride, which would keep him from fulfilling the destiny and the purpose that he was prepared for. Jesus was going to confront it. Jesus was going to say, let Holy Spirit deal with it. Jesus was literally saying, allow me to deal with this now so that you don't have to deal with it later. And Peter, I believe, wept bitterly because he didn't have to go through that if he would just drop to his knees and say, Lord, I know you're right. I don't want to do it. Forgive me. Help me. Whatever the case may be. But the arrogance and the pride and the know-it-all in him decided, you know what? These might leave you. I'll never leave you. Three times. He loves us enough. He loves us so much he's not going to leave you where you're at. He's not going to leave you in a situation to where you're, 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 you're free in Christ, but you're addicted to something. That's the most confusing thing to me, that somebody who they want to dance and they want to sing and they want to raise their hands and all the glory, and yet they still run out of the church, and the minute they run out of the church, they run to the bar and they get a drink. Or they run home and they pop a pill. And you're going, what did all this have to do with any of that? It's flesh. Is there power in all that? You better believe it. But there's only power in it when you allow Holy Spirit to do what He needs to do. He reminds us that He loves us and He's not going to leave us where we're at. Right. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6, here's what He says. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Now, girls, don't get upset. Remember, if I'm a bride, you're a son. All right? All right, here we go. And Gary, don't look good in a dress. I'm just here to tell you. So, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord what? Whom the Lord what? He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, in our world of Dr. Spock <laughs> and the way that we're child rearing, we're beginning to experience some of the repercussions of all that change. Listen, school is a joke anymore. Am I telling the truth? School's a joke. When I was a kid, when you were a kid, you didn't want to get in trouble at school. Why? Because you knew where you were headed. Where were you headed? Well, first you were headed to the principal's office. Or to Jimmy Johnson. And I'm not talking about the NASCAR driver. I'm talking about this African-American guy with arms that look like cannons. I saw him not too long ago as he's aged. He's lost some of that. I'm looking at him going, I was scared of that guy. <laughs> but back in that day, I was scared of him. Donna knows what I'm talking about. This guy was huge. And if you got in trouble, you got lit up in his office. He was the dean of boys. Now, you can say that's wrong or right, but listen, school was totally different back then. School was totally different. 
And, and if you were in my house, which most of those uh, young men, whether they were white, black, Hispanic, or whatever, if you went home, when you got home, you got it too. Because mom and dad didn't play. My dad didn't play. Dad had a rule. You got hit at school, you're getting hit at home. He, he'd say he'd find out later what the deal was. It was just the rule. Because it's, it's you're dishonoring those in authority over you. Okay? See, if you love your children, you're going to correct them. You know, people say, well, you know, you shouldn't spank, you shouldn't do all these things. So you, you tell me this, child, little toddler, uh, Sophia's back there. Little Sophia goes up to the stove, and Darian and Matt, they don't, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to offend her. They don't want to hurt her feelings, but she's going to the stove. It's hot. And, you know, to teach her a lesson, they're just going to let her touch the stove. No, they're not. They're going to tell her no. They may give her a little swat on the booty. Come on, somebody. That's why you got extra padding back there. If you didn't have that, you must have been a bad child. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Correction. Correction. Daddy God loves us enough to correct us. Daddy God loves us enough. Daddy God loved Peter so much that he told Jesus, tell him right now, don't let him live in that anymore. Let's prune that pride. Let's prune that arrogance out of his life so that he's prepared to be the rock that the church is going to be built on. This help anybody today? Amen. Number four, last thing, and I'm done. Oh, I'm early today. I've got to stretch this one out. All right. <laughs> you know, my whole goal in life is to, they put me a time limit. I'm like, <laughs> time limit. Who do they think they are? Why pruning is so important. <laughs> It gives stability to our lives. That big oak tree in my grandmother's backyard didn't have any stability. Even though it had massive roots. Even though it had massive, massive roots. It had no stability because the minute the storm came, the very weakness in its life broke. And it destroyed the entirety of the tree system, of the, the root system. It destroyed the trunk so bad that they had to cut it down. It was a gorgeous big old oak tree. You couldn't put your hands around it. That's how big it was. I forget how many rings we counted in the stump. Granddaddy, um, when they cut the stump, he had them cut it high so that he could put plants on it. Remember, he put about four ferns that he grew on it because it devastated him so much. He regretted not cutting that big old rotten branch out. You see, the stability is in the fact that when we cut the tree, it's able to put its roots down even that much farther because see, if you've got a dead spot, there's going to be some of that nutrient that's going to go try to go in that dead spot and it's just going to hit a dead end. And so the, the roots are not going to go where they need to go and keep us in the storms of life. I love this in Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Jeremiah, of course, is actually quoting from the psalmist here. But here's what he said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Everybody say trust. Whose hope is in the Lord. Everybody say hope. hope. For he shall be like a tree. Everybody say a tree. tree. Planted how? By the waters. Why? Because when that tree is planted by the waters, it's going to get the nutrients. It's going to get the sustenance. It's going to get the life-giving power that it needs, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not uh, fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. Why? Because we're stable. We're stable. The minute Peter got that cut out of his life, he wasn't perfect. I need to stretch the imagination. There were some other issues he had to deal with. Of course, Paul confronted him in Acts. You can read that story. But in this case, it kept him stable because literally that was cut from his life. He would have probably had to deal with that, especially on the day of Pentecost when he stood up to give his sermon. If he would have thought he was all that in a bag of chips, God probably couldn't use him. But because he had been pruned and he had allowed that arrogance and pride to be cut from his life, he was humble enough that he was going to let the Holy Spirit do whatever he needed to do to flow in and through him. And that's exactly what he wants to do in every single person in this church and every person watching online. 
He's pruning us for future growth. He's pruning us for the times ahead, for the seasons ahead, should he tarry. He's pruning us. He doesn't want to leave us where we're at, but he wants to remove all that dead stuff. He wants to get us set so that literally we produce more and more for the kingdom of God. Father, I pray today that you've given me some conveyance and ability to teach your word, to challenge your people. They know exactly what Holy Spirit wants to prune in their lives right now. They already know, Lord. They, they knew it the minute they saw the slide with the little green plant with the pruning shears cutting. They knew exactly, Lord. Some have been dealing with it for a while. And it's time to let Holy Spirit do exactly what He needs to do to cut it out of their life. Not because you don't love us, but because you love us oh so much and you can't leave us where we're at. God, help us. We lay ourselves on the altar today, giving you permission to prune us in those areas so that we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, Lord, all day long, and tomorrow, Lord, as we have tomorrow off, many of us, I pray that we would make it a consecration that as we're resting, we're resting in you and we're saying, Holy Spirit, do what you got to do. If I need to ask forgiveness, if I need to allow you into my heart, Lord, you don't push yourself on anybody. But you simply stand with arms outstretched saying, let me have this and I'll show you greater and mighty things. So help us, Lord. In our inability, you're strong. In our weakness, you are so strong. Help us, Lord. Help us lay aside. Help us not hold on to it. There's, there's someone in this house today that you're, you're, you've been dealing with unforgiveness. And it's turned into bitterness. And it's like a cancer in your life. And it's gone on for years. And you love Jesus. Nobody denies that. But think how your relationship could be with him if you would just allow him to prune that from your life. You say, you don't understand. I've been hurt. I get it. I get it. But he died on the cross for that hurt. And he wants to heal that. He wants to restore what the enemy has tried to steal, kill, and destroy from you. Don't leave this place until you walk in forgiveness today. Even if the person is dead and gone, let it go. Ask Holy Spirit to cut out that bitterness today, to prune it from your life. Let's be sensitive to the Spirit for just a moment. I believe the Spirit of the Lord wants me to tell you it's not Jesus and, it's Jesus. Let me say that again. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus. You'll notice on the platform, we don't have anything with Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's not Jesus and booze that helps you make it. It's not Jesus and drugs, whether they're prescribed or not. It's just Jesus. It's not Jesus and relationships. And those relationships turn into multiples because you're not satisfied. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus. Let go of whatever you're trying to put alongside of Him. Let Him prune that from your life. So that healing, so that restoration, so that forgiveness can flow. So Holy Spirit, do your work do your work in your church, whether they're here watching online today, Lord. And as we go through this, Lord, may we allow you to do the pruning that needs to be done.
because you love us and you want us to stand firm in the times and the seasons that we happen to find ourselves in. I pray that if there's anyone that's not born again, they've never confessed and believed, they've never asked Jesus into their heart to forgive them of their sin, to wash them, I pray that right now that they'd simply either here in this house or online, they'd confess and believe according to your word. They'd confess that Jesus is Lord. They'd believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. That they'd call on the name of the Lord, turning from their sin, repenting of their sin, which means to change their mind. I'm no longer going to live my own way. I'm going to live for Christ. Surrendering all that mess to him. Receiving his free gift of salvation by grace through faith today. Lord, before they leave this place or online, they'd let us know so that we can help them on the journey. Because it's a journey, it's a relationship, it's not a religion. All day long and tomorrow, Lord, give them a great day. I pray, Lord, that whatever they choose to do, whether it's go on the boat or go out to the beach or walk or enjoy family and friends, Lord, I pray that you keep them safe. But most importantly, that everything we do would be centered around you. For we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day.